Rutger, where are you dialing in from? Where are you at right now? I'm based in the Netherlands, uh, a little bit to the south of Amsterdam. What's that chest behind you, Rutger? It looks very old and pre-war. The great chest. I don't know. Yeah. It's my wife's. It looks really yeah, serious. Yeah, I'm not like allowed to look in there. Hold artillery. There's probably <laughs> some. You know, is your Christmas present? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. I guess so. <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> so, Rutger, thank you for coming on to the Jack Jones and Martin Warner show. You're a historian, right? Yeah, that's true. How do we sum up the kind of big idea in your book? What are you trying to get at and what do you hope to achieve from the book? Just at a high level. The book in one sentence would be, most people deep down are pretty decent. So that's it. Um, I have 500 pages of proof if people don't believe me, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book that's easy to summarize. Do you think, people disagree with that sentiment is that why you felt the need to write yeah absolutely i think that the vast majority of people believe that deep down most people are selfish um we don't believe that about ourselves obviously and maybe not about our friends or our family members either but when we talk about those other people you know a bit right. farther away uh on the news or whatever they are all selfish and uh there's actually a really old theory an old idea in our culture that scientists call veneer theory. Um, and, and the uh -huh. idea is that our civilization is just a thin layer, just a thin veneer, and below yeah. that lies raw human nature. You know, the deep down people are just nasty and selfish. And um, if only something, you know, something small happens, like, a, or a disaster happens or a crisis happens, then we reveal who we really are. Now, that idea comes back again and again and again in our culture. We can see it in our movies. We can see it in series like Game of Thrones. Uh, we can read about it in our novels. Um, I think a lot of our politics is based on, on that idea as well. I just think it's wrong. Is that natural human cynicism? So is that part of our human nature to be cynical about other people? In a way, it is. So there is something called the negativity bias uh, that psychologists talk about. Um, so uh -huh. we tend to focus more on the bad than on the good, which makes some evolutionary sense, right? Imagine you're a hunter-gatherer in the jungle. Well, it's probably better to be afraid once too often of a snake or a spider than, you know, not afraid enough, at the, <laughs> you know, at the crucial moment. So there's probably some evolutionary reason why we focus more on the bad than on the good. But today... We're being bombarded by, you know, pessimistic stuff. We just switch on the news. 90% of people in the Western mm. world consume the news on a daily basis. And it's not good for us. You know, it's not good for our, our mental health. Why do you think it's relevant today? It's a provocative question. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, you're on this podcast because we think it's relevant. It's a good question. You know, people, it is people a may wonder why, uh, who cares how, say, hunter-gatherers lived 50,000 years ago. I mean, it's a very different environment. Uh, how can that be relevant for us today? The thing is that for 95% of our history, we were hunter-gatherers. So our bodies evolved in an environment that was very different from the environment in which we are now. So it's helpful to understand um, basically who we are uh, as a species, uh, because then we can also um, you know, make our environment more in line with our nature. And in many respects, I think that a lot of you know, and happiness and suffering from people today is caused by the fact that the systems we build, the schools, you know, the, the prisons, the workplaces are not in line with who we really are deep down. And therefore we suffer. Mm. People get burnouts, they get depression, they get stress, etc. Um, so everything basically starts with how you look at other people. What you assume in other people is what you get out of them. If you assume that people deep down are fundamentally selfish, fundamentally competitive, then how are you, are you gonna organize your schools? How are you or gonna organize the workplace? Well, probably you need a lot of hierarchy, right? You need a lot of bureaucracy. You need a lot of cameras in place. You need basically managers and kings and queens and princes and princesses to tell other people what they should do with their lives, right? Because you can't trust people um, to be free, basically, and make their own decisions. Um, if you turn it around and say, well, actually, I believe that most people deep down are pretty decent, then the question is, well, but can't we then move to a completely different kind of society? You know, do we still need all these 
managers and CEOs yeah, and yeah. people who are in charge and know yeah. best and all the experts and blah, blah, blah. So people might think, oh, this guy's written this nice and happy clappy uh, self-help book about human kindness. But if you really think it through, uh, I think you'll realize that it's quite a subversive idea and it has massive implications for how we organize everything in our society. On a very light example, you saying, for example, the work from home topic that's come up over the last 18 mm-hmm. months where people are seeing productivity is actually yeah, increased yeah. and uh, people are more diligent than they expected and they didn't need to sit in an office all day. Is that an example of that kind of bias that people have before that is outdated? Oh, um, absolutely. There's a distinction that psychologists have been making since the 60s between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation uh-huh. is you do something for the money or for the status, right? Because there's something outside of you that you just want to have. Um, and that motivates you. Um, intrinsic motivation comes from the inside. It's because you just enjoy something, because you really care about it, because you're curious or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. We have long known that both of these you know, sources of motivation can be quite powerful, but they don't work together that well, right? So when people become more focused on the in- extrinsic motivation, right, on the money and the status, etc., they start to lose sight of, why they actually do something, right? Their own natural curiosity and their playfulness. If we move towards a society that is more based on intrinsic motivation, we just do stuff because we think it's interesting, right? We make a podcast or we have a conversation because we thought, well, it's just it's just fun, right? It's just good fun. It's interesting. It's curious. Yeah. You learn something. Um, then um, that, that could, yeah, basically create a totally different kind of society. So in the book, I look at some examples of, of schools and, and also workplaces that try to do this. Uh, also, you know, already before the pandemic, there's one healthcare organization in the Netherlands um, called uh, Neighborhood Care, Buurtzorg in Dutch. And they've... they've, they've Bur- how do you say that? Buurtzorg. Buurtzorg, yeah. The ch is very important. <laughs> yeah, same with my name. So in, in English, I always say like Rutger Bregman, but actually in, in reality in Dutch, it's Rutger Bregman. <laughs> R- Rutger Bregman. Yeah. Wow, that dude, I'm struggling. <laughs> oh, 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 <laughs> you know? Rutger says it a lot better. God, so this uh, organization, yeah, the, Brugster, <laughs> the neighborhood yeah. organization. Yeah, so they, they now have 15,000 employees and no managers at all. It's, it's completely, um, um, they do it with self-directed teams uh, who decide for themselves what kind of additional education they need, if they're going to hire additional colleagues, you know, what they're planning for the rest of the week is. It sounds crazy, but then if you look at the results, um, it's one of the most effective and successful healthcare organizations here in the Netherlands. You know, they deliver higher quality healthcare at a cheaper cost. And the founder of the organization called the uh, Jos de Blok, um, well, his philosophy is basically, um, um, trust people, right? Trust your employees. It's, and that's much cheaper because <laughs> if you want to control them all the time, it's really expensive, right? And you'll probably fail. So if you, if you say to your employees, look, I think you're brilliant. I think you've got great ideas. I'm really curious to see what you'll come up with. It can become sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The power of expectations. Um, so yeah, it has profound implications for, for how you organize everything once you update your view of human nature. How do you feel about that, Martin, being someone who's been running businesses for many years and you have a management style I, I, when you hear that? I think we, what need do to, you think? I think we need to drill it down. I think there's a number of different practices and the the... Of, the, of what I call traditional thought that have already been written about, right? Mm. So when I think about manifestation and I think about uh, the way it's been written uh, in the past, and, and so we look at defining behavior and laws of attraction, and, and, and it's not scientific enough for, for me personally, but I understand the way people want to define societal relationships, so to say with money as an example. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I think of the pyramid model and think that, um, what you're actually defining is that if we have a different view of about ourselves, so let's say an intrinsic view, mm. first of all, that strikes or smacks at uh, a level of authenticity that, that is often missed if we use some kind of societal construct to organize people, a management style that's generally we thought worked before, so we'll try it again. Whereas if we say, well, let's just mm. think what Martin's thinking this morning, what Jax is thinking, what Rook is thinking, and, and tell them they're great, and all of a sudden we get a whole different level of diversity that comes out and Mm -hmm. and maybe you can organize people differently like that. Um, Not sure how that um, 
I'm not sure necessarily that without processes and tools that you can organize in the masses effectively. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Um, so I, 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 the, the answer is I think we have, to break it, we have to break it down. The idea of accepting that there's an inherent goodness in people can't be a bad thing. Right? It, I mean, just can't, the, the construct of thinking no, that, that we don't have to worry about you know that the, the, the people uh, you know, have defense mechanisms. I, I you know, I, I think of the chimp paradox and the concept that our reaction theory, the concept that uh, you know, a, th a part of our brain uh, sounds the alarms, right, or it's the mm. chimpiness, right, and mm. it reacts to certain things. So, in certain constructs, no matter how authentic we are, no matter how good we are, um, all of a sudden we react. We react under competition, right? We react mm. under pressure, targets. Uh, we act. Re we react under dogma, right? If we, as it evolves over time, we put a different color on race or a different color on prejudice, a different viewpoint. All of a sudden, we react. So, even if we are good, and even if we look internally, uh, we are, we still need tools and processes to get round how we evolve an aggregate view about a, 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 a perspective. Um, I'd be interested to hear. Yeah, as we kind of get into this conversation, how you break that down? Like how do you still get away from the fact that we have these defense mechanisms? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I almost look at we generally are good. It's like when I look at animals, and I'm, you know, my wife and I are huge animal lovers, right? Mm -hmm. I think generally, you, you know, oh, we know, and yeah, and yeah, and, you know, I've got seven dogs. So you look at dogs and you say to yourself, oh, look at look at them, they're beautiful. Look, they're generally are not going to bite. They just they. They, they just love people. Actually, they're dependent on you, right? They're dependent. So I can mm. take the optimistic view that they, yeah, they yeah, love us, yeah. but they need food. They do need love. Well, that's the thing. I always look at it like, well, they, they want to get fed, so they're going to yeah. be nice to you. And as long as you're providing that, then it's cool. But it's a cynical view, right? To think like that. When actually, I think they're inherently good, but yet you know. that's it. But now you put them in a situation, a competitive situation, or you put them in a threatening situation, and that changes, right? Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it gets bad. They'll mm. bite someone and that, that can be a bad thing, right? Yeah. And if, you know, dogs get put down for that, sadly, right? Um, but, but we don't put down humans if they bite, right? But, <laughs> but nonetheless... We, we imprison them. We imprison them maybe, but... You put them in cages. But there's a challenge here. Yeah. Right? So the, the, you know, the reality is on the one side, you can say we can decide to be good and then you can organize life around goodness or the likability factor. But then there's the other side where, where as we aggregate, and deal with issues in society. And we maybe are still uh, maintaining some kind of best version of ourselves. But the reality is there's another side of human nature um, where you need diplomacy, you need tools mm -hmm. um, mm. that get us past some of these issues that drive out greed, you know, that drive out these sins that, that, that mm. exist. Like in politics, it's born to f*** They up, are there. Right? It's born, right. There yeah, are yeah. different areas of life that are born to challenge us, right? Yes. Uh, there are industries that are imperfect. I'll never buy another used car, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're realtors. No, but do you think that if we, I'm, I'm going to be try and be objective here, is it because at the heart of it, this cynic, this idea is grown, so where everyone believes everyone's out to get them anyway, so they might as well do the same thing. And if you break that down and wash it away and start as, I think you're insinuating some sort of like, new point of view which is why it's radical in some yeah. senses is that if you do that then you wouldn't have as much of those symptoms of the negative parts of human yeah. behavior yeah yeah right? uh, that would be my argument uh, look today we've built systems for example if we look at how welfare is organized in the western world um we focus on the one percent right we focus on the one percent of people who may commit fraud right who are not really eligible to to get benefits or something like that and so we've built a whole system where people have to prove over and over again that they're really sick enough, that they're really depressed enough, that they're really a hopeless case who will never get anything done in their lives. And then once they've gone through that, you know, through all the interviews, filled in all the forms, they are depressed. You know, they are a, a wreck, right? Sure. Uh, so it's a system yeah, that yeah. produces dependency. If you turn it around and if you say, look, sure, there will be some, you know, lazy people who just want to watch Netflix all day, buy drugs, whatever. Well, so be it. Um, but we're going to focus on the 99% of people who want to do something with their life. We'll give them a basic income, mm -hmm. right? Some venture capital for the people. Um, they can, you know, buy the basics with it, food, shelter, clothing, bit of education. 
And then they have their own, um, what is it? F*** you money, right? They can say no to things they don't want and they can move to a new job. They can start a new company, etc., cetera, et cetera. It's, it's not enough to live in luxury, obviously. Almost everyone wants to earn additional money on top of that. But it is based on the premise that most people want to make something of their lives, which is, I think, correct. Sure, some people not, right? But are we going to focus on them, right? Are we going to build the whole system for that 1%? Um, I think that's very often what we do, you know, on an organizational level. It's mm. what governments do. It's what people do in their daily lives, by the way. They, they, they sometimes are, I don't know, the, the victim of a con artist or something like that. And then they become distrustful of strangers for the rest of their life, which is a little bit sad, right? The way I look at it is you should just accept um, that you'll be conned a couple of times in your life, right? There are professional con artists out there. They're much better than you. You know, they'll abuse your trust. And if you, <laughs> if you really don't want that to happen, you've got to be distrustful of everyone all the time the rest of your life. I think that's a much too high price to pay, right? I wouldn't want to pay, pay that price. So what I've, I've, I've just said is, no, I accept it. It's collateral damage. And people who've never mm. been conned, I always tell them, you know, you got to see a therapist because your basic attitude to life is not trusting enough, right? There's not something wrong with you. So that's, that's yeah. sort of the way I look at it. You, you got to sort of think about the trade-offs and, and what are you willing to accept? I guess speaking fluidly, um, and you touched on some interesting ideas, which I think we should pick up um, regarding like uh, basic income for people and things like that. Even listening to you speak, it does trigger something in me where it's like, nah, but you're, you're wrong. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I wonder if, <laughs> you, you know, and I'm, a, I, I'm watching my daughter grow up and she, yeah, she's shy around people. She's nine months mm. old. There. But in, once you get past that initial bit, she's happy to be around you and is not distrusting of it. Right. And I wonder if we all start off like that, but then we inherit our parents' mm. bias, all their experience. You're told, don't talk to strangers from mm. an early age. You're told, basically you're taught to mistrust. And as society develops, like I'm reading stuff about, um, you know, ways to teach your children how to interpret sexual misconduct for all the terrible like people out there that do all that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, it's hard to get away from it, especially I would say, the more we progress now, I'm hearing more of that cynicism. Mm. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I wonder if, I think at a basic level, we are trying to be empathetic, mm -hmm. but there is, we is it almost we've come too far? Do you know what I mean? Is it so revolutionary, your idea? Or is it that revolutionary where intrinsically we do mm. believe that? But is your um, argument aimed at the 1% that are totally cynical? Do you know what I mean? And perhaps the systems that are built around that, because I think that's down to control. Mm -hmm rather than, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, like empathizing with the human yeah. experience. Do you know what I mean? I think normal people try to see the good yeah. in others. You know Cynicism I mean? is the ruling ideology of those at the top. You know, if you're a cynic, that's, that's the greatest gift you can give to those in power. Because, you know, if people can't be trusted, then we need them, right? Then you need uh, the police, military, powerful rulers, really rich people controlling us. Right? But if you believe that people are fundamentally decent, then maybe we can move to a much more democratic, egalitarian society. Right? So there, mm. a lot is at stake here. I really like the point you made about um, your daughter being playful and the, that maybe we lose some of that playfulness as we become older. It's something that... Where it gets drilled out yeah, of you. Yeah, it's something that biologists would agree with. So we know that Homo sapiens is you know, one of the most playful creatures in the animal kingdom, right? And we play by learning. Playing and learning are also almost like the same words. Um, mm -hmm. But then as kids grow older, they, they go to school. And then learning becomes often becomes this top-down process where we have a curriculum and mm -hmm. we say, okay, you got to learn this, you got to learn that. And that is important. And we have standardized tests, which often, you know, test your ability to do standardized tests. And not, you know, not actually know anything about the real world, if you ask me. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, then you lose some of that playfulness, right? So, some psychologists call it parentification as well. Is that parents have all these ideas for their kids, right? They got to go to music class and I don't know, sports, etc. And the whole week is planned, right? And the kids lose sight of their internal motivation, right? Of their And they don't build their own moral compass, for example. And then as they grow older, they're 20 or 25 years old and they can't rely on their parents anymore. It's like, um, they're lost, right? 
because they haven't developed yeah. as adults, as autonomous human yeah. beings who actually know something about the world, who've explored. You see that a lot. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. lot, especially among privileged people, you know, who went to the best universities, you know, to Harvard, to Princeton, whatever. And they come out of that and, yeah, you know, I, I don't know how you look at this, but the people that I'm most impressed, uh, you know, by in my life, um, you know, who I really look up to, you know, the, the intellectuals, entrepreneurs, you name it, almost always they have a story of how they hated school and how they were a total failure in school, right? Almost always. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's not a to- like, a, like a total natural law or law of physics, but it's really striking that some of the, you know, the most interesting and smartest people I know didn't do well in school. Now, what does that mm-hmm. tell us, you know, about our educational systems? And can we change that? I think we can. But yeah, the, the challenge here is quite profound to the way we do things right now. Is this about fundamentally starting at this position that we trust people and that they're good and that we can then organize ourselves differently to achieve some of these goals? Or do you expand the, the, the research or the thesis to um, examine other parts of the human condition? We have still this other problem that we had today, that society has always believed that we could be good for the masses, but actually that when we come together, there are all these other dark forces that, are ex- that exist that require mm-hmm. tools and processes. Mm-hmm. So does mm-hmm. the book ultimately change anything, even though you're fundamentally right? that there's a lot we can get by recognizing the good in us, but we still have all these other challenges that exist because we all exist on earth. Um, yeah. Religion and faith has tried to coordinate that better. Yeah, just yeah, like education, yeah. just like businesses have, have been doing that. Yeah. The societal uh-huh. constructs. Uh-huh. What do you think, Rutger? Am well, one of, the arg- something? one of the arguments I make in the book is that many of these things are quite recent. So, for example, if we look at something like war, uh, for a long time, people believe that war has always been with us, right? That already when we were nomadic and togetherers, we were these cavemen, you know, bashing in other people's school, skulls, etc. Were they not fighting over over land? Yeah. You, know, you stole my cabbage Or patch. something like that. Well, that's what we used to believe for yeah. a long time. But now anthropologists sure. and archaeologists, most of them actually believe something quite different. So if you look at the archaeological evidence, there's pretty much zero mm-hmm. evidence for warfare before, you know, around 15,000 years ago. And that's a very important moment because that's when we started to settle down. And we, shortly after that, we invented agriculture, which was one of the main main sort of shifting points in our history as a species. Um, So it's it's actually interesting. The story they told me when I was in in school, you know, in high school and also university was that um, Mm -hmm. basically life was pretty bad as a hunter-gatherer, but, you know, as we became more civilized, life became better, right? We settled down in villages and cities. We invented agriculture, so we had, therefore we had more food. Um, we invented the wheel, we invented uh, writing, etc., and all kinds of wonderful things. And every step was, you know, a step of, of human progress. Um, but now, actually, if you look at the latest science, it's pretty, they paint pretty much the opposite picture. The picture of um, us living, you know, a pretty good existence as nomadic and togetherers for around 300,000 years. Um, we lived in relatively small egalitarian societies. We're relatively healthy. Um, no pandemics, for example. No infection diseases like malaria and the plague and measles. Um, uh, you could describe the first men as proto-feminists. Uh, for a long time, there was this focus on men being hunters and women being gatherers. We now know that a lot of women also were hunters, actually. So. There's even one anthropologist who, back in the 60s, called it the original affluent society, right? That if you would have to choose, do you want to be a hunter-gatherer 100,000 years ago or do you want to be a farmer 10,000 years ago? Well, you you better choose, you know, the existence of a hunter-gatherer. It's a much better existence. But then everything went wrong when we settled down. We, you know, we got hierarchies. We got all these infection diseases because we lived too close to each other and to our domesticated animals. Um, the era of warfare started. There's a lot of evidence for, uh, for that in the archaeological record. So something mm-hmm. really, really went wrong. Uh, as, as you talk what about, what would have Martin. caused that apart from human nature? What would have caused so, that? Um, there's a concept in evolutionary anthropology that's called the mismatch, where where evolutionary anthropologists say that sometimes how we have evolved doesn't really work with the systems we've built. A very easy example is our food supply, right, and our food system. 
Um, when you were a hunter gatherer and you encountered a tree full of fruits, well, then it makes sense to eat them all, right? It's just that uh, you store a lot of energy <laughs> in your body and it doesn't happen every day. So when you see it, just eat it all. Now, if you go to the supermarket and you see, you know, everything that's there, it's not very smart to eat it all, right? What you get is an epidemic of obesity. So there, it's a clear mismatch, right? Between our natural inclinations and our instincts and the environment that we're in right now. Um, I think you can look at much of civilization in that way. Is that civilization has obviously brought us a lot, you know, very powerful technologies. And especially in the last 200 years, we've made tremendous progress, you know, radical decline in, in extreme poverty, in child mortality, etc. But if you look at so many, so many of our problems, it's, um, I think it's, it's caused by this, this mismatch between human nature and the, the world that we've built. This gets to something that, that I, I, I still struggle with. When I look back at your example, let's say, I look back and I think to myself, what did we actually learn about our evolution? Well, we learned that, that the human condition and that nature itself is A, first of all, trying to survive. I'm not trying to give you some management theory like Maslow mm -hmm. or anything, but it sounds like the, the, you know, the hierarchy, right? But let's just say we A, need to survive. And then we look for some kind of you know, uh, nature itself, looks for something greater than survival. The fact that we have this powerful brain that we perhaps, as, as far as we know, uh, perhaps the, you know, the most intelligent species that we know of, as we move forward, we're developing all industries and all these things. It seems to me that we never get past the constraint that we need to organize. And as a result of organizing, that there's negativity that comes from bad practice because we're only human. And if someone gets more mm. bad practice, we tend to do bad things. So if someone said, I can't eat today, I'm pretty certain if they thought they were going to die, they'd probably kill the person next to them. Hold up, right. but what Rook was saying is that we built our whole society aimed at those individuals rather than the rest of the people that are doing good stuff. Is that not what you're saying? <laughs> Rook? <laughs> hmm. Well, I, I completely agree Save with us. you that scarcity uh, can bring out some, you know, some really bad behavior. So this is also why, why I made the point that some anthropologists think that the state of nature was actually the original affluent society. But there wasn't right. all that much scarcity, right? There was just a huge amount of mm. food. There were a lot of wild animals to hunt. Yes. Uh, there were, you know, fruits and vegetables everywhere. So there wasn't all that much scarcity. And if people had some kind of conflict, well, they could just move away, right? It's a traditional yeah. way of solving conflicts. Yeah. You just go somewhere else. But then yeah. when people settled down uh, and they developed agriculture, they, they became, you know, they got stuck, basically. They lost their way. They, they, they didn't know how to be hunter gatherer anymore. It's really complicated, right? So there's a lot of cultural knowledge involved here that you learn from your, your parents and your grandparents, etc. So when people stop doing that, they can't go back anymore. They've sort of lost that way of life and, and they became, uh, they became farmers. But then, you know, when you have, uh, you know, a bad harvest, what do you do? Right? Mm. Well, you don't have anything to eat. Um, do you go to a neighboring village and you ask them nicely, well, can we eat something, right? So you can understand how, how when, when people became sedentary, also the potential for conflict really, really increased. And yeah. uh, this is just right. one mechanism at play. There are many, many other, other mechanisms. And you can probably write libraries full of books about what happened in that period. But it's, it's, I think it's really yeah. striking that, um, that there indeed seems to be this mismatch. You know, biologists today, they, they even talk about this whole notion of survival of the friendliest, which is very much the opposite of what I used to believe. Uh, there's now a lot of evidence that for thousands of years, it was actually the friendliest among us who had the most kids and had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation. It was nice guys finish first. Um, and the reason is pretty straightforward. Again, if you're a nomadic and together living in the Ice Age, it doesn't really help if you're a narcissist, right? If you're really arrogant. Because what are people going to do? You know, they're going to cast you out of the group. Uh, they'll expel you. You'll go hungry and you'll die. So imagine, mm -hmm. you know, someone like Bolsonaro uh, from Brazil or Donald Trump in prehistory. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have survived for long, right? They're not really products themselves of survival of the friendliest. Uh, but today we have created very different kind of systems, different political systems as well, that you often can describe as survival of the shameless where the shamelessness is actually 
in a way, sort of an evolutionary advantage, right? Where you can just do things that other people can't do because they would be too ashamed. And I think that's quite an indictment of the systems we build. If you again go back to what makes human beings unique, one of the most striking things that I discovered while I was researching this book um, is that we are the only animal in the whole animal kingdom with the ability to blush. Right? Isn't that fascinating? Mm. Right? We involuntarily yeah. give away our right. feelings to other members of our species. Why do we do that? How could that ever be an advantage? Well, it helps us to establish trust and to work together. Uh, but then if we look at many of our political leaders today, well, they don't blush a lot, man. They don't do that anymore. I want to talk about this one thing about complexity. And that's that humans, as we evolved and we just learned, and we found this, this plethora of resources through the different you know, stages of our, our evolution, um, mm -hmm. we're capable of dealing with complexity. And uh, sadly, we can't go back because we've built layers and layers of human progress. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, mm. we've, we've procreated uh, and balanced procreation with our needs to survive and, pro and progress through society or what we, we then developed as society. How, how can complexity of, 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 of played a role in the fact that complexity breeds other parts of the human condition that we wouldn't have seen from prior history? Mm -hmm. It gets to a really big question that if we look at other animal species, yeah, pick anyone you want. Let's look at the giraffe roaming around mm -hmm. looking for some water. Water was one thing, but if the, if the giraffe's got an erection, that's a whole different matter, right? Mm -hmm. So if... If, if the giraffe needs to procreate, it will kill another male giraffe in order for the land. But, and it will do the same for water as well. And I would argue that the human, if, you know, if it's led to, I don't know, think about the uh, Andes, right, and that horrible idea of, of cannibalism, right, back years ago when the plane crashed, right? Mm. Uh, we, at the end of the day, are complex animals. But all of a sudden, you put us back in that raw situation without the complexity we can respond like, 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 like other species. So does complexity, our capability to progress and improve our lives, just come with the fact that it's got not so much to do with the fact that we are inherently good, but that we're dealing with complex systems and processes? It comes at a price. It comes at a price. Yeah. Right. That's a good way of putting it. It sure. just comes at yeah. a price. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's an anecdote from, I think, the 60s or the 70s when a Chinese bureaucrat was asked what he thought about the French Revolution of uh, 1789. Um, so that was uh, like two centuries earlier. And the Chinese bureaucrat said, well, it's too soon to tell. Don't know yet. And I, I, <laughs> I've always loved that. It probably never happened, right? With all good quotes, probably uh, never said it. But anyway, um, I think that sort of sums up quite well how I think about civilization, when people think, well, civilization was a good idea. I don't know. It's uh, too soon to tell. We just started out, right? You're right? I Maybe love it. Maybe it will be I extinct in, in two centuries from now, right? We've got some some existential risks right now with its global warming, or some people are talking about the risk of AI or, well, pandemics. Uh, I mean, you could say that COVID was, or Corona was just a baby pandemic and uh, could be much, much, much worse. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, think about synthetic biology, what scientists are doing right now. It could be a matter of time before, you know, some scientist develops uh, a virus that is incredibly contagious, that takes uh, around 30, 40 days to really develop as a disease and could be, you know, 100% deadly. I don't know how, mm -hmm. how we'll defend against something like that. And it could be actually a really good weapon of mass, in, mass destruction as well, much cheaper than nuclear weapons. I think always the case with nuclear weapons, obviously, is that, um, um, you know, you, you need quite a lot of money to build a bomb. Um, so you need at least to be uh, uh, a state, right, with, with some financial yeah. means. Um, with synth synthetic biology, that could be really different. So I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe we, we are all living, already living in the end age. Maybe not. It's very, very hard to tell. But we are taking incredible risks that are unprecedented, right? That we never did in history. I think we should, by the way, we should become much better at, at thinking about risks because this often happens when we, for, when people, for example, talk about global warming, there's this whole debate about 
you know, how much warmer is the planet going to get? How much, you know, uh, does the planet respond or the climate respond to additional CO2? And people have all these debates and they throw studies at one, one another, right? Uh, but you got to think about this in terms of risks. If there's just a, a 5% chance of things getting completely out of hand, right? Of, of, of a climate of five degrees or six degrees warmer in a hundred years. We would never take that risk in our own life, right? Would you want to buy a house that has a 5% chance of collapsing and, and killing you and your family, right? Never. You would never no. accept that risk. But we are accepting those risks as a society, as a civilization, which is nuts, which is absolutely bizarre. So, um, so yeah, indeed, with, with the complexity, with civilization as well, we've, we, we've, we've had, to pay, um, had to pay a big price. But then does that go against what you're saying in terms of humans being innately good if once the complexity comes mm -hmm. in we change um why you know what would have caused that well i would argue that actually our success as a species is fundamentally connected to our our friendliness or our intelligence and our friendliness are are almost the same thing um mm. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a complicated story, I must admit. There was a, a Russian scientist called Dmitry Belyev in the, in the 1950s who started a, a really unique experiment. He um, wanted to domesticate an animal, a silver fox, you know, an animal that had never been domesticated before. I, I think listeners will know what domesticated animals are, right? Sheep, cows, For pigs, sure. Et Although when you say a silver fox, I think of an older gentleman. <laughs> well, this is actually uh, just a fox that, you know, has a like a silver like yeah. skin. Anyway, the an you can't domesticate a silver fox. <laughs> yeah. uh, the animal was really aggressive, right? It was a wild animal and it had never been domesticated before. And so what Dmitry Belyev wanted to do was a, it was a really daring experiment. He basically wanted to replicate um, in, in his experiment what had taken centuries in nature, right? This very long process where there's a selection for friendliness and tameness and where you turn a wolf into a chihuahua. You know, that, turned, that, that took a long time. Um, <laughs> So he started to do that, and and uh, it worked actually. Uh, already after ten twenty years, he saw that um, some of the, the the foxes were much friendlier, much tamer. But more interestingly, when they started to do intelligence tests and especially social intelligence tests, it turned out that the friendly foxes were actually smarter than the aggressive foxes. Right? They were better at interpreting social cues and, and learning from humans, etc. Um, so there's one. Really important evolutionary anthropologist who who wrote um, based on on this study and on his own work is that if you want a smart fox, you don't select for intelligence, but you select for friendliness. And what scientists now think is that the same thing happened in our own evolution. You know, um, Neanderthals were on an individual level probably smarter than us. They had bigger brains, you know, around ten percent bigger. But collectively, we became much smarter because we we started to learn from each other. It's, 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 it actually connects to a really deep and philosophical question. What is wealth, right? Or where does progress come from? And we very much, we very often we focus on individuals, right? Really brilliant people mm -hmm. like, oh, this inventor or that guy who came up with, I don't know, the Einsteins, the Edisons. But what's really interesting is that if you, as, if you look at it as a historian, what you often see is that the same thing gets invented again and again and again in a certain period, right? So the light bulb was invented by, I don't know, 30 or 40 people. It's just that one guy got the patent and became really rich, right? Uh, because he was lucky enough to, <laughs> to really run very fast to the patent office. Um, but sometimes ideas are just in the air because collectively we've been moving somewhere, right? And the collect our collective mm -hmm. brains have been, been growing. And I think that's really how you should look at human intelligence. And this is also, by the way, what distinguishes from other animals, right? It's not that individually we're so so smart. I don't think we're, we're a human is that much smarter than a giraffe or a chimpanzee. Um, and by the way, I think very often we underestimate the intelligence of of animals. And very often we have no clue just how smart they are. Um, but what we do know is that we have built these huge collective brains where we started to learn from each other and also... Uh, you know, stored our knowledge in books and in texts, etc. Um, and that is something that no other animal has been able to do. Uh, wow. I, I mean, so interesting. I just want to validate. I'm going to give you a sample. Mm -hmm. uh, you, add, you know, if your next book, you, this, this is going to be perfect. 
So, I, 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 I being a being a, a owner of seven dogs, I mm. can I can support the friendly concept because no, I'm, I'm dead serious here. I have a I, I have a sample of of pack animals, and it just happens that that there's one. The dog's called Spot. Who, ha- mm. who who she she determined shout out spot I, I, I'm, I'm dead f- serious here she has figured out in the pack right that they're all trying to figure out where they fit in the order so mm. we have a little dog that's trying to use her dominance over the dogs in order to survive and the friendly dog the most friendliest dog has made friends with the whole family and it doesn't matter what personalities and they all have different personalities the friendliness wins over she has the most peaceful life. The, the, the two dominant dogs don't pick on her. One of them mm. loves her, and it's because she is likable. And she, is, and she goes and nurtures, and she cares for the other dogs, and she's found a way through being open to deal with all of the different personalities. But I think of that in society, that it comes back mm. to this idea of likability. Does being likable, does being friendly ultimately produce a better existence and i don't i think any intellectual probably could tell you i can tell you in the business world that if you're a likable salesman or saleswoman you're going to do better mm-hmm. if True. you're likable at school you're likely to do better right I, I i i don't see anything wrong with that construct but but i wonder in this as we've moved into kind of collective intelligence and we think about complexity Here's, a, here's an interesting thing. Does complexity ultimately breed other problems that an aggregate or a, a society has to solve? And does complexity ultimately bring down a civilization? So, so sharks have been around, what, millions and millions of years, right? If we go back to the megalodon, right? Can we say that about this latest version of, 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 uh, of humans? Uh, or are mm-hmm. we just going to blow ourselves up with, with, with nuclear bombs or invent, as you said, you know, a virus that creeps out of a lab that we just can't contain or whatever? Mm-hmm. Maybe the trade-off is fair, right? That, that, that we may end up uh, evolving or destroying ourselves through mm-hmm. complexity. But what we would have had was this incredible accelerated existence. I think mm-hmm. of, you know, I think of so- the Inca tribes and think of some of the things that these advanced races had. I think look at Rome, right? And and and, and what happened? We, what look at all the things we got from Romans, but mm-hmm. look at where they ended in the end. Is this yeah. just a p- price we have to pay for progress? Mm-hmm. What do you think? It's one of the one of the mysteries in physics, right? If the universe is so big, and there are so many planets that seem to be inhabitable for life, then why haven't the aliens contacted us yet? Right. Oh, we have an answer to that. <laughs> the actual uh, we spoke with Brian Cox and asked that. Exact okay. Question. Terrific. Well, and uh, yeah, go on. But keep going. I won't. I, we'll give you the answer. Okay. Later. Great. Well, I, I, one one possible answer is obviously that as soon as a, as a civilization becomes too complex, it it kills itself. Right. Yep. And that's the mm-hmm. point. Maybe yep. that's the point. This is a fair point. Yeah. No idea. You could also you could also say that you know it's really unique and we are really alone in the universe. And if you think about it that way, then just think about the value that will be lost if we go extinct, right? That's exactly what Brian Cox. Yeah, said. that's and the then, point. You, yeah, you never would want Man. to take the risks, even if it's like a zero point one percent risk of extinction this century. You never would want to take that risk because that could mean potentially hundreds or thousands of billions of lives lost, right? Mm-hmm. But perhaps now is also, by the way, a good time to think about um, the dark chapters of human history, because this is obviously that people throw at me. Is, you know, uh, Rutger, if uh, if you think that people are so friendly, what about Auschwitz? You know, what about the concentration camps and For the sure. ethnic cleansing, right? Um, and I think this connects in an interesting way to what you said earlier, Martin, um, is that humans want to be liked. And this is both our superpower and our greatest weakness. We just yep. desperately want to be part of a group. And we are even willing to do the most terrible things if we can then be part of a group, right? We commit the most horrible crimes in the name of loyalty and friendship and comradeship, um, right? 
And um, yep. we have this sort of this tribal nature, this groupish nature, where often the rest of the world becomes dehumanized, right? And we, we look at other people as strangers and we don't see people anymore. In, in a way, I mean, you talked about animals. Uh, we can see it really clear there, right? A lot of people love their dogs. And at the same time, they have no issue with eating chickens who've been tortured, you know, their whole life. Um, which is strange, right? From an, from the perspective of an alien, that would seem very weird. If a Martian would study us and sort of describe our society, well, these, it's a very strange creature, you know? They, they really spend billions and billions of dollars as a society on their all their pet animals. But at the same time, they have these concentration camps for chickens where basically they have evolved chickens to be as miserable as possible. And they slaughter them when they're 40 days, days old. They're constantly in pain. Uh, the, these, these humans have even done experiments where they've shown that these chickens prefer food with painkillers. They prefer to eat painkillers all the time because they they always have pain. And, you know, most people don't have any issue with it. You know, they eat <laughs> chicken all day. Uh, and at the mm-hmm. same time, they love their dogs. That is, that that we are psychologically capable of that is very, very disturbing. And I think it's a, we see a similar psychological me- mechanism in in ethnic cleansing and genocide, etc. I don't want to morally compare. I don't know what some animal activists do. Like, oh, the farm, factory sure. farming That's is a holocaust. Point. You shouldn't make those comparisons. But on a psychological level, I think something similar happens. Is that we sort of don't think about other humans as 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 sentient beings anymore. We start to see them as things that you can just mm-hmm. use or you can just do with it whatever you want. And it's, that's really disturbing. I know of no other animal that is capable of doing that. But sh- surely then, if we're going back to your book where the idea is about we're inherently good mm-hmm. and we've built, if then the product byproduct of complexity, the byproduct of tribalism and all as the world evolves mm-hmm. are these extreme ideas where we have these conflicts, then isn't that still human nature? Oh, absolutely. So... I think I wouldn't say that people are fundamentally inherently good. We're, I mean, we're clearly not angels, right? We're, yeah. We can be jealous. We, we can be aggressive. We can dehumanize other people. So the, the title of my book in German is Im Grunde Gut, which I really like. It's like, like in the basis, basically good. There's something fundamentally, uh, foundationally that is, that is good and that we can build on. But yes, there, there's, there's a lot of nasty stuff in us as well that we got to deal with. And uh, that can become worse even in, in, in certain environments and in, in certain corrupt systems. Um, mm-hmm. I guess I guess the, the really important takeaway here is what I mentioned earlier, is what you assume is what you get. So I'm very wary of adopting a cynical view of human nature because I'm afraid that w- it will produce the kind of people that you presuppose. And I, I think there's a lot of evidence for that, uh, that cynical leaders can, you know, make cynical people. Um, if you, if you believe that citizens, for example, they don't care about politics, they're lazy, they just, you know, they, they follow it for entertainment, etc. Well, that's what you're going to get, right? I think you can clearly see this in, in a country like the US. But you could also do democracy in a different way. And there have been experiments with that, where you just randomly select people from the population and say, okay, you're going to be the, a politician today. And we're going to talk about really complex issues such as, I don't know. Uh, what, what do we do with drugs? What do we do with violence in our communities? How do we organize the welfare state? And you put them all together around the table, people from the left to the right, rich, poor, young, old, very diverse bunch of people. And you let them discuss these controversial subjects and they come up with perfectly reasonable compromises. It's fantastic. Really. There's a lot of experiments being done right now with, with this, what, what they call deliberative democracy. It's all about what you assume in other people. If you assume that people are lazy and stupid, that's how they're going to behave, right? Uh, if you assume that they can actually contribute something, you'll be surprised. But I think the 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 I think the f- common factor in all of this is the complexity. So even what you're talking about, yes, he, on many anecdotal moments, like in my life, in people's lives, you see this working. Uh, but when you add the complexity of mass, it becomes difficult. Hmm. I would disagree with that. I would, I would really disagree with that. Why do you disagree? Well, because there's, there's clearly examples. You know, the organization that I talked about has 15,000 employees, right? The, the healthcare organization, Gutsorg. <laughs> um, um, if you look at some um, democracy, like the, the original Greek democracy, by the way, 
the word means rule of the people. And if you if you would have asked an Asian Greek uh, to take a look at our democracy today, the person would say, well, this is not democracy, right? This is an mm. elective aristocracy. You, you're allowed to choose your own aristocrats. But then there's very limited choice, right? You've got these crazy dynasties like the Bushes and the Clintons and then the, 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 the role of money in politics, right? You need millions to even do... Uh, join a race for a Senate or, or, or the House of Representatives, right? That's not actual democracy. So what the, the Greeks did is randomly select people from the population. And it was a, I mean, it was a relatively large society, right? Um, so I think you can actually scale this up. And there are examples from around the globe. Obviously, we'll have to experiment, right? Um, we'll have to learn, learn as, as we go along. But I, th- I, th- I would say that there are ways to do it. When I got when I was getting at the idea of complexity, I just think that the, the, the complexity is is a, a lens to explore how uh, you know, the mass the, the, the mass behaves, right? But mm-hmm. but actually, I think that the, the question about learning uh, or the way humans learn uh, or applied learning. So let's say that we're generally collaborative, right? Let's say that our brains mm-hmm. are forged in a way that the nurtured existence is as important as as as, as nature. So that you, mm-hmm. know, you, me, together for the next ten years, hopefully, would you produce a you know we are smarter than me concept, right? So mm-hmm. one plus one, we might get to a three on a decision rather than two, and that sounds kind of cool. That if we trust everyone, um, that we that we can um, you know evolve to to some better state because we've we've learned. The challenge is that I don't think that if we didn't optimize certain ways to um, manage complexity Mm -hmm. that we would had necessarily through um, I'm not saying that there is not like you said it's an experiment there's many ways to organize Mm -hmm. there's many ways if we'd started out differently maybe we would still have invented the light bulb maybe we would have still have invented 5g maybe we would have have, Mm. have put um, you know or started to create an interstellar race coming back to complexity we are privileged enough to be able to solve things that we never understood through this modern mm-hmm. taxonomy and syntax of applied learning, right? It's really yeah. powerful, right? Yeah. That we can even think in math terms at the level that we can. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that requires a sophisticated way to organize human capital. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm interested if, if that furthers the discussion in your mind or, or you have a reaction. Uh, yeah, to yeah, absolutely. I think I would mostly disagree. Um, so just that okay. the world is com- complex doesn't mean we have to uh, organize our society in a in a really complex way. So take, for example, innovation, right? There's a great book written by Mariana Mazzucato, an Italian economist, that's called The Entrepreneurial State, where she shows convincingly, in my view, that a lot of um, breakthrough innovations are, uh, you know, invented by researchers in the government payroll. That's true for pharmaceutics. It's true for the iPhone. She's got a wonderful chapter in her book about the iPhone where she shows that every sliver of technology in the iPhone, voice recognition system, you know, the battery, um, GPS, obviously mobile technology, the internet, everything that makes it a smartphone instead of a stupid phone. So it's all from the government, basically, mainly from the US military um, funding, DARPA, but also big EU grants, European Union grants, um, and how was that done? Well, obviously not because there was some bureaucrat in Brussels or Washington who's like, okay, we need voice recognition systems, right? It was actually more like, let's, let's throw a lot of money at, um, at people who do fundamental research. And we accept that a lot of people will come up with, you know, something that's not very useful. Uh, and, and when that happens, by the way, there's a lot of attention for that in the press. You can maybe remember Solyndra. Uh, in in the US, which is like a, a solar panel company that went bankrupt, and and especially mm-hmm. Republicans were like, oh, see, the government can't do anything. Um, but I guess if you look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective, you just say, well, you try a hundred things, and ninety five fail, and and five become at, turn out to be really big successes, and they pay for all the failures. Um, I think governments can and should become better at thinking in those terms doesn't mean you have to organize it in a really complex way, right? You can just say, okay, we're going to devote this and that amount of money to fundamental research in this area. And we're going to let experts and people, uh, you know, the community judge for itself, you know, what are we going to focus on? Um, 
I think that could be an example of how you could do it. Same is true for basic income, right? So basic income would obviously require raising taxes, right? You need that. Uh, but once you have the money, you don't need a super complex system to say, okay, you are going to get this and that amount of money and food stamps and whatever if you, uh, if you apply in the right way and all the conditions are there, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can make it much more simple and just say, look, we're going to build a floor in the whole income distribution. No one's going to be poor anymore. Poverty is just going to be completely abolished as soon as you fall below the poverty line. Doesn't matter if you're, if you're black or white rich or uh, if you've worked hard or if you're lazy all your life, we don't care. We're just going to pull you out of poverty. It's, it's much more si simple if we, if we build a system like that. And, th and, th and this, this also connects to a more fundamental point that I'd like to make about complexity. There is so much bullshit complexity in this world. And there are a lot of people making a lot of money by pretending things are more complex than they really are. You know, that is basically the whole, <laughs> well, or... 90% of the banking industry, right? It's it's basically coming up with these hugely complex financial products that are not really necessary, but that people don't really understand. And then they you make a lot of money. So I, th I think that a lot of what we call the knowledge economy is actually um, unnecessary complexity where people learn a certain jargon and they learn certain theories. So, so I, I'm just a little bit wary of people who say, Oh, everything is complex. You know, can't understand it because a lot of those people are writing reports. No one's ever going to read, right? Sending emails to people they don't hate, sitting in shitty office jobs, basically wasting their lives, pretending the world is too complex. It's somewhat revolutionary in as much that if we actually was to take that view, we would say the human experiment hasn't worked. Right, there's a lot of things mm. in, in human experiment, but I would argue that that the the the, the difference here. Um, and by the way, I don't complex. I, I was making a slightly different point of complexity, and that's that if you can accept that complexity has a lot of shit that we've created. Bad banking products was a great example, but there's lots. Mm -hmm. There's so many things we don't need. I'm not so sure that we need all the things in the digital world that we have. I'm also not so sure that I, I Apple ever believe that they invented anything other than brought uh, applied learning uh, together mm -hmm. and it happened to be a phone. They didn't invent the smartphone. They didn't invent any of these technologies. We know that, that, that they can come from government and other military and other places. Yeah. Um, but, but, but the application of it is what's important. Yeah. 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 And so don't get me wrong, we by need... the way. That is fine. That is fine, right? So I, have my, I love my iPhone. I think it's a great product. And cheers to Steve Jobs. I think it was a brilliant man, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but the thing is, if you then take all these fundamental inventions from the government and make a really nice product out of it, it would be quite nice if you pay your taxes, right? So that we can fund the next round of fundamental innovation. I don't know if you've seen the latest news from Pro ProPublica, who got the, you know, the tax records of mm -hmm. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, et cetera. Yeah. They, they pay pretty much nothing, right? There were a couple of years where Jeff Bezos paid zero, zero, nothing in federal income taxes. I don't know. Where are the pitchforks, man? <laughs> it's. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I hear you do, but I think that comes to a point of, you know, and Martin's right, you know, your middle name should be revolutionary. And I asked the question, maybe you just don't want to, is why you've written a book. Why don't you go in and do something about it within, it, within the systems that are there? Because what I'm, what, what I keep thinking about when we're talking about these ideas is that they're all, good valuable practical experiments mm -hmm. as we say at this point but there is layers of shit on top of shit. <laughs> and there's no singular yes everything could be stripped back like we talk about the old cities like in italy where the old city got shit up and they built another one on top but then the foundations are shit, <laughs> so now they have to go back and fix all of that yeah. and i think that's where we're at with society where we're trying to create a better tomorrow but it's always based on what's happened today and I think the what you're saying are all good ideas, but there's it's a lot of other factors at play, and it's hard to get them across the line really mm. at, at a massive level. How would you go about doing that, and how long? Do you, it's a big question. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the most fascinating questions you can ask as a historian is how will the historians of the future look back on us? Because we can obviously look at say the Asian Greeks or the Mayas or the Incas or the Middle Ages. And in some respects, we can really admire them and, and look at their technological achievements and their cultural achievements and say, wow, these people are already so smart. But in, in some ways, we're also horrified, right? When we look at the slavery, we look at the 
human sacrifices, we look at the witch hunts, the Inquisition, etc. And then we like to believe that we are much better. Now, where it gets really interesting is indeed if you zoom out and, and ask the question, well, how would the historians of the future look back on us? Well, they say, well, these people were exactly the same as us, right? They had also reached the moral, you know, superiority. They were completely fully developed. Um, well, probably not, you know, in some ways they will probably be horrified or, or, or find some things really weird. You know, about what we do. We already talked about the treatment of animals. I think I'm, I'm quite sure that a hundred years or 150 years from now, people will be absolutely horrified by, by factory farms. Um, but you could say something similar for, for work. Uh, I, I believe that one of the greatest tragedies of our time is that there are so many super smart, brilliant young people wasting their life, you know, basically doing jobs that they themselves really hate. Right. So it's not me saying it. It's people themselves saying it. Um, there's, there's some research into this concept. What the anthropologist David Graeber, who sadly passed away last year, but he, he had the scientific term for it. He called it the bullshit job. And so the definition of a bullshit job is that the, the person who has that job, him or herself says, my job is meaningless. You know, I don't contribute anything to society. And what's so interesting is that. It's not the plumbers, right? It's not the teachers. It's not the nurses. No, it's often people who actually have wonderful LinkedIn profiles, you know, who have really good resumes, who have good jobs and a nice salary and are building up a nice pension, who went to great universities, who in almost every respect are the winners of the knowledge economy. They are incredibly successful, uh, according to the standards, definitions of society. But then if you ask them, you know, privately, maybe at a birthday party, you give them one beer, maybe two. They'll start to admit, you know, that actually they think their job is completely meaningless. Now, who are these people? Well, they quite often work in, often work in the financial industry or in management or consulting or marketing or et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's quite interesting, by the way, that there seem to be many more bullshit jobs in the private sector as in the public sector, because in most countries, the public sector is full of healthcare and education, right? And, those people tend to believe in what they do. Um, but I think that's that's incredibly sad. That it's really sad that all these smart people who could go on and think about the cure for cancer or, you know, how we're going to colonize the solar system uh, and 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 and, and um, build flying cars, you name it, right? Um, they're doing something that they personally do not believe in. But somehow we've built a system as a society that that yeah that puts them there right i think that's the real tragedy um it's not i don't think by the way it's inherent to capitalism i i think those discussions are often a little bit boring you know where people on twitter start shouting oh socialism oh capitalism market versus state right doesn't have to be this way i think that capitalism could be much more productive if we find ways of actually pushing or or, or I don't know, getting people into jobs that they actually care about. By the way, also with uh, much higher taxes on the rich, but that's just a pet project of mine and I won't bore you further with it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I, <laughs> I, uh, I think we, um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't just accept that. And there should be a, a much more thorough societal debate about basically um, what, do we, what do we value who are the real wealth creators out there? And I, I don't want to paint a simplistic picture of like, oh, all the bankers are useless, et cetera. It's obviously not. Uh, but it is, I think, really tragical is that if you look at some of those polls, there's one recent poll in Britain that found that 37% of British workers think their job is meaningless. I don't know. That seems uh, very, very tragic to me. But is everybody motivated by productivity? Sometimes it's just you, you get a job because you want to live your life and that's the price of doing that and they don't value it. So I think there's an obsession at the moment with being productive or being a high contributor to society, but sometimes people just want to exist. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And having a job and earning money is part of existing in today's society it doesn't always have to be like that and as you've mentioned in other societies yeah. where money wasn't the focal point but that's what we have now yeah. so it, and that results in doing a job at times yeah. do you know what I mean I, I would I would also disagree there so I think the goal of civilization would be full unemployment I think that in the end we should basically abolish the whole concept of the job 
and give people the freedom to decide to do for themselves what they want to do with their lives. I know that sounds radical, but I think it makes sense. It's radical. Uh, if you zoom out a little bit, because as we become richer and richer and richer, right, there's more and more capital. Uh, you can, you can basically give everyone a share of that. And I think this whole notion of working for your money or that basically we use the threat of poverty to motivate people because that's essentially what we're doing. Um, I don't know. It seems to me really uncivilized, and 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 it's not what we should be striving for. Uh, actually, if you read, for example, an economist like John Maynard Keynes, one of the mo most important British economists of the 20th century, he predicted in 1930 that by 2030 the working week would shrink to 15 hours a week, um, because as we would become more productive, right, and the machines would become better, and the robots would take more and more of our jobs. We could basically afford to start doing other things in our life, right? And I don't know, paint or, or make podcasts all day or whatever, right? But the whole notion of work would, would disappear or maybe would, we would redefine it. Um, and actually, for a long time, people believed that that was going to be the future. Up until the 60s and the 70s, psychologists were worried about, you know, the, the, that, that everyone is going to be unemployed. And what will people do? You know, it's going to be the age of boredom, etc. And people thought, oh, we should change education and, and help people not to prepare for a job, but to prepare for a life well lived. Um, but we've, we've really lost that dream. And now we have so many people stuck in jobs that don't really need to exist because we have this ideological obsession that everyone needs a job. But why? If the job is unnecessary, why not abolish the job and just give people the salary? It's a big comment. Some big talk going on here. I would argue that radicalism is a great way to say, look, we don't need society. We just need people, and we put a different syntax on it. We don't need work. Mm -hmm. uh, we can just exist. We can come up with a word, blubber fat, as a way to live life, right? Live fat with nothing. But who's going to feed me? Because there's too mm -hmm. many people on the planet. Who's going to give me the opportunity to get to an A for B? Because I've been used to wanting to travel. I can't go by horse and chariot up to Grimsby or, or you know wherever you want to go in, 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 in your country. I'm, I guess I'm just getting at this point that, is the experiment just the experiment? Or in your book, do you have some conclusions where you say, you know what, um, the evidence is showing that, that if we did X, Y, Z, we could mm -hmm. still have progress. We could live a happier life. Um, mm -hmm. And, and isn't, I think what you're really getting at is well-being, right? You're getting at can human nature still progress? Because without progress, mm -hmm. life seems pretty boring, mate. Right. If we yeah, don't have any yeah. kind of progress, life is poor. So to assume I just want to go back and munch, munch on fun. I don't want to be a cow in a field. I don't want to be fodder just eating. That's interesting, actually. But I guess my point here is, do you have a conclusion that says, yeah, there's some obvious things here um, that could drive society forward? Because this is back to that cracking the code um, statement at the start of the um, conversation. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting that you say that. It you're looking for progress, which makes you a very modern person. For the biggest part of human history, people didn't really believe in progress, or it, did, it did, may not even have thought progress was a good thing. True, they true, thought true. history was circular, you know, and that it just goes and rounds and rounds, and that's the way it should be. So it's that's this is, by the way, what I love about history. It just makes you question the status quo. It, there are so many ideas that we take for granted, such as you should have a job, right, and you should work for your money. Which, which may seem completely obvious right now, but it's, it's actually been invented at some point in history. And there will also be some point in the future where we, we won't believe in it anymore. One of the yeah. reasons I wanted to write this book is, is to basically show that there are already a lot of people who have adopted a more hopeful view of human nature and who are putting it into practice. Um, one of the most radical examples that I give in the book is the Norwegian criminal justice system, which is really, really crazy if you haven't heard about it. So what they do there is they have prisons with, you know, hundreds of inmates who've done horrific things, you know, killed other people, uh, tortured them, rapists, they're all there, right? Um, but then these prisoners get the freedom to, well, really develop themselves, socialize with the guards who often don't even wear uniforms or weapons. Um, they can go to their own music studio in the prison where they, they even have their own music label, which is called Criminal Records. Um, they've got their own prison blues band, etc. Uh, they can go skiing. They can go, like uh, go to the yeah. cinema, etc., etc. 
in so many respects, you think, oh, these Norwegians have gone nuts. You know, they're absolutely crazy leftist, progressive idiots. This is not what a prison should look like. But then you look at the scientific evidence behind it. So there's one really important thing in criminology that is called the recidivism rate. The chance that well, someone will reoffend, you know, commit another crime once he or she gets out of prison. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so you could argue that the job of a prison is to get a recidivism rate that is as low as possible, right? Because you basically want to a lot of them will, will go back into society, right? You don't want to send back ticking time bombs, but you actually want to send back people who are better people and will be able to contribute to society, pay taxes, etc. It turns out that these Norwegian pri- uh, prisons have the lowest recidivism rate in the world. So scientifically speaking, they're the most effective prisons out there, but they don't really look like prisons at all. Now, the question is obviously, what will the victims think about this, right? The people who have lo- lost, lost loved ones, for example. Um, and here it, it gets really interesting and even moving because many Norwegians really want it to be this way. And they say, look, we don't want to sink to the level of the people who've done these horrible things. You know, we take away their freedom. That is our punishment. But we do not improve people by punishing them further, you know, by making them miserable as they do in the US, for example. We know that in the United States, actually prisons increase criminal behavior. There are taxpayer funded institutions, really expensive institutions that create more crime, which seems to be a really bad proposition if you ask me, right? Would you want to pay for more crime? No, rather not. And um, that's just one example of how updating your view of human nature um, changes everything. What is the barrier for countries like the UK and, you know, we talk about America where we see so many of these kind of symptoms. Yeah. What's the big barrier for allowing these things to happen? Is it just a different status quo? Uh-huh. It's a big question. I would say that the the central barrier is that in the US you have so much zero-sum thinking, both on the left and on the right. So people say that if you win, then per definition, by definition, I have to lose, Right. There's only one cake. And if you have a bigger part of the cake, then that's not good for me. While in Europe or, you know, especially in these social democratic countries, there's more win-win thinking. If we work together, if if we all pay our taxes, then we can invest in things that are really sensible, like universal healthcare, for example, and have a cheaper, more efficient system that we all benefit from, whether you're poor or rich. So that is, that is really central. By the way, uh, this zero, zero sum thinking, I think it was really dominant if you, if you look at the modern Republican Party, it's someone like Donald Trump. I mean, he comes out of real estate, which is, which is basically a zero sum mm-hmm. market. So that, that explains a lot. Uh, but you also see it, um, you see it on, on the left as well. When, when people, uh, talk about white privilege, for example, mm-hmm. white privilege is, is zero sum thinking. You basically say, look, you white men, you've got a privilege and I'm going to take that away. And then, my life is going to be better and you'll be less privileged. And uh, intellectually, I understand where it comes from. And you could argue that white privilege exists. I just don't think it's a great slogan to convince people, right? I'm going to take something away from you. You got to feel guilty about you having that in the first place. And that's how we're going to change the world. If you, if you would say, move to win-win thinking, there's a great book recently published by Heather McGee called The Sum of Us, where she, she has this fantastic anecdote of <laughs> Um, public swimming pools in the US. So during the, during the sixties, a lot of these public swimming pools had to open up for black people, right? And what, especially in the South, what, what many, um, towns did is they rather close the swimming pool, you know, put it full of concrete, then open it up to black people, which is again, it's, it's just this example of zero sum thinking, you know, we'd rather not have a swimming pool than share it with you. Uh, That's crazy. We used to have a swimming pool. We don't have it anymore. It's, it's absolutely crazy. But in a way, you can look at, um, uh, healthcare in that way as well. You know, what a lot of white Americans would really, really Mm -hmm. benefit from universal healthcare. Uh, they really, a lot of white Americans really suffer that they don't have it. But why don't they have it? Well, in a way, because they'd rather not have anything than share it with blacks. So you could argue that. That this 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 racism is also endemic and and also enforces this zero sum thinking, and and it's so important to go past that and actually show that we can all benefit if we work together. It's enlightened self interest, right? It it can be perfectly selfish to help other people. Got two questions. Maybe Jack's got a question before we wrap up. 
do you really think that Neanderthals lived a better life than we have today? <laughs> hmm. Hmm. It's hard to say, you know, compared to, to, to who, who lives today, right? Some Neanderthals were probably happier than, you know, quite a few people who are alive today. Yes, I do think so. Um, it, what about so the greater it, relevance argument? I mean, so, so we can always argue that there are pockets. There's you, me, and Jax. We all live in different lives, um, and we all view life differently. But if, we were, if you were to say, on aggregate, you took the totality of Neanderthals, you took that to where civilization is today, and you stuck yeah. the median line. Would you, yeah. do you, would, you well, go let's, back, let's, would you go back in time? Let's say I'm behind the veil of ignorance, as philosophers call it. And I get the question, you can choose to be incarnated as a human being in the period that we call civilization. So say the last 15,000 years, or you can choose to be incarnated as a Neanderthal or other hominid species hunter gatherer. What do you choose? Well, I would definitely choose the latter. I would definitely choose the, the hunter gatherer existence because the chance that I'll be, you know, Rutger Bregman living in the Netherlands, you know, living a reasonably comfortable existence is just so small. I'll probably be a farmer, you know, be some slave of a very rich guy and live a horrible existence that's incredibly unhealthy, you know? So if you would have to choose, I would much rather be uh, a Neanderthal or a, a human hunter gatherer who's actually free than to be uh, a civilized person. But obviously, if I can choose between saying, being a Neanderthal or living in the Netherlands at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, yeah, obviously the latter. Yeah, you must be a pretty good disco dancer because you were, you <laughs> yeah, were, you were, true. you were no, tapping on both sides of the fence there. Pretty damn well, Rutger. I mean, I mean, it was, I, I was, I was going to say uh, what it feels like to be an intellectual with quite a radical view. Do you just spend most of your time trying to argue because you just must get a lot of teardowns. Like I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about the humanitarian crisis in Israel and Gaza. I'm thinking about, you know, we talk about zero sum games with white privilege mm -hmm. and black lives matter, but these are things that exist. However you want to frame mm -hmm. it. Do you know what I mean? Whatever the syntax, whether it feels nice, if it's the most efficient way to combat it, you know, these are real problems where people are being affected. And it's kind of like, you, you must just spend your whole day <laughs> trying to like manage your way through this. <laughs> Well, if you if you want to build a theory that, I don't know, works for everything, a theory for, of everything, then yes, life can be really tiring as a writer or as an intellectual. But I'm, I don't think I'm really trying to do that. I think I'm, no. what I'm trying to do is recognize mm. the paradoxes and the contradictions. Yeah. And you're presenting an argument. Yeah. On the Got one you. hand, we're one of the friendliest species in the animal kingdom. On the other hand, we're probably also the cruelest. And we just want to be liked. And that's exactly the problem. Um, but a lot of people who are really impressive, who really achieve something in this world, you know, who, who do the right thing when things are really tough, um, they have a very different psychological profile. Uh, so yeah, I like to, I like to study those contradictions and paradoxes. I think that's, that's important and it helps us to, yeah, understand the world and maybe also improve ourselves because that, I think this is very often the biggest problem with us is that we just want to be like, it, it's left me pondering a number of views and, but, but let me say this. Would you, if you said, what is the one thing that you want people to get from your book? That it's realistic to assume the best in other people. So it's not naive. You don't have to be ashamed of it, but it's realistic. And there's, you know, there's a lot of good scientific evidence that supports you when you assume the best in those around you. Well, um, I'm, I feel like uh, if, if the world was made up of more of you, We'd, we'd be in a happier place. Huh. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know who do, uh, you know, all the practical stuff because uh, in many ways I'm so incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>